Investors are bracing for sharp changes in financial markets. After nearly three decades of calm, inflation has exploded in advanced economies around the world. As a result, it might be harder to find a job soon. Forecasters think global growth is going to stall. American households are pretty unhappy, and when the households are unhappy, they tend to spend a little less. We've had that yield curve inversion, that's something that we're looking at, but I wouldn't say that recession's on the horizon for the next six 12 months or so. The top financial authorities in the U.S. hope this all blows over quickly. They're making lending more expensive to control inflation before it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But the only tool that the Fed really has to bring inflation down is to let interest rates rise to whatever level it takes to cause a recession, which then breaks the back of inflation. Investors believe the central bank will lift interest rates to 2.5 percent or higher in 2022. This is what you have to do, slow down the economy in order to take that steam out of the system, the steam of inflation, which eventually can burn you really badly. The big risk is a repeat of one of the worst chapters in American history. Escalating prices. You know, the 1970s were a really hard time. Now we're in a new mistake where inflation has lasted longer and looks like it could risk being around for longer than they had hoped. Can the Fed engineer its soft landing or will stagflation return to the U.S.? Stagflation describes the dual threat of stagnant economic growth and persistent inflation. It can happen when a central bank tightens its economy in an attempt to keep prices in check, but an unexpected shock keeps those prices marching upward. Inflation hit 8.5% in March 2022. That's the fastest monthly change since 1981. I think if you ask anybody, rich or poor, they're going to say, yeah, I'm definitely seeing it my food costs. I'm definitely seeing it when I'm, I'm putting gas in my car. Americans haven't seen anything like stagflation since the 1970s. Central bankers call this era the Great Inflation. That was a decade of persistent economic mismanagement. For years and years, the Federal Reserve attempted not very hard to control inflation and in the end persuaded itself that it couldn't control inflation. Meanwhile, fiscal policy was stepping pretty hard on the gas pedal and that kicked off a round of the economy persistently being overheated. As this financial crisis unfolded, funding for public services dried up, cities like New York fell into disrepair, and labor unions went on strike across the country. The financial problems went mainstream as gasoline prices ramped up. We'd have to line up at the gas station on alternate days, depending on what your license plate number was, and you could get gas. And that really led to a significant inflationary spiral. Richard Fisher led the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas from 2005 to 2015. Now, the chairman of the Federal Reserve then was a man named Arthur Burns. Before Arthur Burns, they just looked at all the data. And then he stripped out one or two variables, gasoline, which is variable in price, that is fuel and energy, and then food. But by the end, he was stripping out almost everything. And he turned out, brilliant economist that he was, to probably be the most disgraced Federal Reserve chairman in history. 1973 dramatized U.S. dependence on foreign oil. He was also struck by some exceedingly bad luck in the form of the two oil price shocks that were delivered by OPEC. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries imposed its boycott and within a year raised prices more than 300 percent. That, of course, sent shock waves through the U.S. economy in the form of higher gasoline prices. So you had rising inflation at the same time that you had the unemployment rate going up, which was stagflation. It was against a backdrop of a lot of policy mistakes, already inflationary environment. Inflation had tripled in the 1960s during the Vietnam War, but also was being forced. And there are memos saying that the changes that they were making would actually, some of those policies would result in double digit inflation. The Fed's warning to Washington politicians came true in 1974. That year, prices across all categories rose more than 10%. A new president stepped in with a plea. We must whip inflation right now. The president lost his fight and prices kept rising. Public trust in government was on the decline. When we try to beat inflation with borrowed money, we just make the problem worse. 
President Carter appointed the economist Paul Volcker to lead the Fed and asked him to do whatever it took to rein in prices after a decade of explosive growth. Mr. Volcker then began to tighten monetary policy and took those interest rates all the way up to about 18 percent, uh, created a recession, which was the only way to solve the problem of hyperinflation at the time. He became immensely unpopular. There were countless death threats against Mr. Volcker. The Fed uses its federal funds rate to control the cost of loans. Under Volcker, the federal funds rate shot to nearly 20 percent. High interest rates discourage investment and job creation. The 1970s were really the result of a two decade long inflation, the inflation that Paul Volcker broke the back of in a very bloody manner. And it was incredibly excruciatingly painful. And what they have shown central bankers, not only in the United States, but around the globe ever since, is the central bankers can control inflation. And to an important extent, we've been benefiting from the economic dividends associated with low and stable inflation ever since. And all of that is thanks to the leadership of Paul Volcker. Wages and prices often play leapfrog. Many things have changed in the U.S. since then. For example, fewer workers have their pay tied to changes in the inflation rate. As a result, wage growth has stagnated for four decades in America. Workers at Amazon warehouses, Starbucks cafes, and Apple retail stores are fighting for new benefits. Union membership is down sharply since its heyday. If more workers organize, that could push wages up. Investors also seem to think this inflation is different than the 1970s. That episode absolutely spooked people, enough to send money flying out of bond markets. When was the last time inflation was actually this high? You're looking at the early 1980s. I think you're pushing almost 13% in the 10-year treasury versus now. I think we're looking at 2.6, 2.7. Bond yield data can show how much people expect prices to keep rising. If the yield rate is high, as it was in the 1970s, it means investors won't fork out cash without the promise of a big payday. The Fed can distort these markets for safe debt and they have for more than a decade, but that era is coming to an end. I would say that over the next several months, you're probably gonna see the Federal Reserve stick to their calls and say, you might start looking at reducing the balance sheet. And that's also going to have a, an impact on the bond market, equity market, as well as the consumers and, and what they're gonna feel in their wallets as, as far as what they're paying for. Over time, the threat of stagflation faded as advanced economies relied on cheaper labor abroad to produce goods. An entire generation of investors have enjoyed consistent returns as a result. This upcoming chapter could be different. They need to tighten up on the money supply and tighten up on the stimulus that the Fed gives with these very low interest rates. And I believe they will and keep this from getting out of hand. For investors, this is going to be, I think, a bit of a shock. And that's an understatement. Investors don't have any muscle memory of what it's really like for the Fed to actually fight inflation versus preempting or just adjusting rates to be in sync with a stronger economy. Expectations of future inflation are back on the uptick. This puts the central bank in a tough position. Over the past two financial crises, they bought bonds at a scale never before seen. Now they're scaling that stimulus back while hiking interest rates at the same time. What the worry is, is that there's a lot of law of unintended consequences that kick in as the Fed starts both raising short-term rates and then amplifying those rate hikes by reducing their holdings of things like treasury bonds and mortgage-backed securities. And there is no real roadmap to do this. Energy prices could be the source of inflation in America for years to come. Russia's war in Ukraine sent gasoline prices up, and that is making other products more expensive. Well, let's think of a, a, a grocery store you go into. It has to be air conditioned. Secondly, a lot of frozen food, that takes energy. Uh, and one begins to build on the other. In the 1970s, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries controlled global supply. OPEC's actions drove gasoline prices sky high in the past. Today, OPEC is a partner to Russia, a major exporter in its own right. The U.S. and its allies want to wean themselves off of this supply. During the 1970s, the U.S. was a huge net importer of oil. We saw dramatic growth in the volumes of energy provided by oil and natural gas. When the world price of oil went up, we were hit badly in two ways. Prices of domestic goods, like gasoline, went through the roof. And secondly, it was like we were shipping some of our income to for foreign producers. So it was an adverse uh, shock 
It caused unemployment to go up. The big shift today is that we produce about as much oil as we consume on average. And so when the world price of oil goes up, as a nation, we don't suffer nearly to the same extent. Many things remain unsettled when it comes to the future, but one thing is certain. That clean energy transition is not just coming, it is here. Researchers say climate regulations will introduce new risks to the market. The financial industry could end up favoring sustainable assets and penalizing polluters, but demand for both products will ebb and flow, taking commodity prices along for the ride. The swings could lead to a boom-bust cycle that regularly affects the finances of households in the States and abroad. I would say that this de next decade might look different, and with that, I would expect more volatility. So what can regular people do if rocky times are ahead? If you're between the age of 18 and 25, the unemployment rate in the United States is 2%. It gives workers enormous bargaining power. And this is what's known as a wage price spiral. And we're in the midst of it right now. And the Federal Reserve's job is to quell that pressure by tightening monetary policy, and they're just beginning. We do have a labor market that is finally allowed some people to stand in the sun and see their wages increase. That said, that sort of ease with which we find jobs is not gonna be quite as easy this is a difficult period of time, to be sure. Inflation is higher today than it has been for 40 years, but I think there's some reasons for optimism. For one thing, the Federal Reserve has credibility today, which it did not have when Paul Volcker took office. That credibility turns out to be a critically important asset for a central bank because inflation, to an important degree, is a self-fulfilling prophecy. I wouldn't want to be scared, worried about all this uncertainty of what might unfold. I would look at it as an opportunity. Where I find people get caught in trouble the most is trying to live the champagne lifestyle on this beer budget. Make sure that every single dollar is earmarked, whether it's going to an investment account, a checking account, rain it in, and don't want that cushion for that rainy day because that rainy day will be coming.